Well, I, I didn't sleep last night, you know that? <laughs> I was nervous, and uh, I always get nervous anyways. You know, I, like Pastor said, it's been 10 years in, in, uh, in, in our church in Esperanza, and I still get sick to my stomach every Sunday morning. But I just got sicker, I mean, more sick this, this, since last night, and I was like, oh, Lord, what am I going to do, you know? Uh, I hope they understand me with me and my accent, you know? So you guys can understand every word that comes out of my mouth, right? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> well, the reason, the reason we want, we're, we're, the reason um, we wanted all to have this service is because of the heart of our pastor. We've seen, uh, we seen what's taking place um, not only in, in, in our nation, but also in our, in our church. And it is said that, that, that um, whatever takes place outside in the world, it comes in into the church within five years. We start living that out. And I, and I say about that, as I say that's false. It takes only less than a year today. We are being, uh, we, we are being divided in this nation racially, at this moment, more than ever before, by people that we trust and we consider them our leaders. And I think that that is one of the difficult situations that we're living at this moment in this country. I was, um, the sermon, I call this sermon, um, God is never late. But I'm going to tell you something. I actually called it the silence of the lambs. You remember that, that movie? That is the church. We have been silenced for way too long. And that is the reason that we find ourselves in the place that we are as a nation, divided. Our kids are being taught to hate one another because of the color of their skin and not the character of their heart. We see it everywhere now, East Coast. Teachers, principals, putting African-American kids in one area, white kids in another, Hispanic in another. And that is causing so much division in this country. And I want all of you today, if you, if you take anything from this, I want you to understand that we are all the same under the shadow of the cross. There is no color when it comes to the church. And I know that many times we, tell, we want to think that we are going to start, you know, going out there and going against them, against those people, and ridicule them as well, and tell them how much we hate them as well, and how much we disagree with them. But then reality is that we forget that we as a church have to pray for them as well and love them and respect them. But I think that it, all that, everything that's taking place out, out there right now, it's also coming into the church. So for, I lived this way before. I'm well experienced in hating people, you know that. I know what it is to hate somebody to the point of killing somebody. I know what it is to hate somebody because of the color of the skin. Because for too many years I lived this way in prison. Thinking of, thinking of people less than me, hating people. I used to detest, detest anybody that wasn't like me. I didn't like African Americans. I didn't like white people. And you know why I felt that way? Because I hated myself. I hated who I was deep inside of me. I hate everything about me. And it also was ignorance. You see, race is, race is about ignorance. And I tell you, I am so blessed, and all of us, we can say this, we are so blessed that we live in a country like this country right now, right here, 
That we have so many opportunities, and it doesn't matter if you black, brown, green, yellow, I don't care what you are, you have the opportunity to become anything you want in this country. Because God has blessed this nation. We are blessed. And I'm one of those. Imagine, I, myself, a person like myself, could never, ever do what I've done in life in my own country. I've done so many things. I experienced so many things in this life, in this world. And I've seen the Lord work in people's lives. You know that us as pastors and also you guys that are here, you have such a great honor that you have a front row seat to see the Lord work in people's lives. And to not wonder. Not, and, 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 and you know what that causes is for you to always be in awe. When was the last time that you said, Wow, Lord, that is amazing what you did there. And we're fortunate. We are blessed. And that is because we, we this country, it still stands on biblical truth. We are, we're, and I tell you, I know that it's hard. I know it's going to get very hard before it gets better. But I tell you one thing, it starts here today. It starts here in the church. We're not going to be silenced no more. We have a calling, and that is to go and preach the gospel, love and respect all the time. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself so you guys can get more of an idea. And I know that a lot of you already know, especially uh, Esperanza knows where I'm coming from. But listen, I'm going to tell you a story, where, and it's, it's true. On April 21st, 1519, the Spanish uh, explorer Hernán Cortés sailed the port of uh, Veracruz. They came into the port of Veracruz. It was 11 ships. Think about this, okay? 11 ships came in, and you know how many men Hernán Cortés had? Only 600 men. And they came, and they were going to battle the Aztec Empire, the Aztecs had thousands upon thousands and thousands of well-trained warriors. And, these, uh, and here we have Hernán Cortés with 600 people. And he knew that the odds were not that good for him and his soldiers. So he had to start thinking, what am I going to do once we get there? What am I going to do with my soldiers? Are we just going to run away or get defeated just like the other two expeditions before him? And look what he did. Once he got to the port... Once everybody cut off the ships, he decided to go and burn the ships. Because that way, his soldiers, his men, will not think of running away. Think about that. What a great guy, huh? <laughs> so here we have, so they go, to, they go to war, they go to battle. And Hernán Cortés establishes and he conquers Mexico. That's why I have blue eyes. <laughs> <laughs> they were Europeans. But listen, I think that in, a, in the spiritual realm, for us, I think we need to do the same thing. We need to burn our ships, man. Any option that we have today... Because as you see, everywhere we go, we have so many options. And we need to start thinking about how can we, how can we, or what can we do to make things better in our society. And it starts here with the church. And you, you know what? I am so honored and so proud that I, I'm able to, to come and speak about this because our pastor, which I love and respect and honor you, um, he has said, Armando, I can't speak about that. But you can, because I'm Mexican. <laughs> and I'm going to milk the cow. <laughs> and I'm not afraid. Listen, I'm not going to be afraid if they call, me, they call me some kind of names or one of you. Uh, I don't know. I hope not. You, go, you guys go and cancel me. Please don't do that. 
<laughs> don't cancel me. I tell you one thing, and that is the reason that I'm here this morning to share a little bit about what's going on in our lives out there. And you know what's going on out there, right? You, we're not blind, right? We all see, we all hear what's going on out there. So I want you, I want you to prepare yourself, and I want you to just think, oh, what is it that you're willing to do to change all these things? But remember, they're not our enemies, okay? They're not our enemies. They are our brothers in Christ, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we've got to remember that. So I'm going to continue with the series that we've been having, which is a overcomer. And to be able to become an overcomer, you have to understand and you have to know who is your enemy. If you don't know who's your enemy, if you don't know who you're fighting against, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to make a lot of mistakes, and that is the reason we're going through this at this moment. Because we don't know who is the true enemy. So look what it says in Ephesians. Do we have Ephesians chapter 6? It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the, the devil's schemes. For a struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Do you understand who's our enemy now? Amen. And let me say this, a spiritual battle is taking place at this moment in this world and in this country. It's taking place at this moment. And now that you know this, it should be of, of importance to you and to everyone here that we need to rely only on God if we want to be more than conquerors, if we want to be overcomers, we have to understand this and rely only in God. The battle is going on in this world. It's going on. So what is it that you're willing to do? Because listen, church, everywhere we go and everywhere, every time we turn on that TV, what is the first thing that we see? It's bad news everywhere. We, we hear how different schools, different people are attacking our children and trying to place in their hearts that just because they're white, they're, they're, they're racist, or because we're brown or because we're black, we're not supposed to associate with them anymore and put them, on side, uh, put them outside or on the side and not deal with them and teach my kids, Hispanic and African-American kids, that they are victims of those kids because they're white or because they're from somewhere else. And it is not truth. Our enemy is the devil. Not our children. Listen, I listen. 70, 60% of all music that I listen to is from African American artists. And I love Motown. I listen to my wife. I, that, man, I have to, whatever I'm doing, I'm listening to music. Most of the music, there are children at this moment they, that they listen to. Most of that music is by African American artists. But look, once they go to school, they go to different places, and they're saying to them, they're teaching them that they're racist. And that is not true. That's a lie of the enemy, because the real racists are those people that are trying to divide our own children. Yes, they are. And I say it, and I will continue to say it until I do get canceled. Listen to this. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, he calls Satan a thief who came to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's exactly what he's trying to do, not only with our children, our families, but also our church. If there's no healthy families, it's very hard to have a healthy church. And I tell you this with... with I, sometimes I don't even know because my, I try to talk to my wife and, and she says, but what are you going to do? You can't do too. so much. Well, I think I'm in the right place. Let me say this to you. Our society 
is in serious problems. Serious trouble. There's been a dramatic drop in our educational system, our morals, inequity. And, now, and, and besides that, we have a dramatic, listen, rise in crime everywhere. And we're not talking about 20%. We're not talking about 30%. We're talking about 200, 300% in different cities. Oregon, different states, California, 300%. And we see it everywhere, violence. Where is it all going to end? And I tell you this, many of these, all these social problems are attributed to this, to the decline of a healthy two-parent family. Men are absent If you're a woman, that you're a single mother, I admire you. You're at the right place. The statistics that I'm going to share with you this morning, they're not for you. They're for those that are still out there. I know that a lot of women say, I don't need a man. Well, I'm pretty sure you don't need a man, but I know you need Jesus. Amen. That's what we need. And if you are a single dad here, or you have walked away from your children, listen to this. This is for you. Jesus loves you no matter what. And it's never too late because God is never late. Take the time to call your children. Call them. Fathers. Failure. And we haven't done enough. I'm going to say it. And we, the church, have not done enough to promote godly manhood, biblical manhood, to be, be, to be able to equip families so we can have this unity and this respect that we so much need. I remember, I remember a long time ago in a church like this where I, I gave my life to Jesus when I first started coming to church. I went to a man's, um, a man's breakfast, and um, there were like about 30, 40 men there, and I was there, and I was, you know, I, I kind of, I'm not saying, you know, I mean, people kind of uh, come to me, and they were asking me things, and you know, and you know what I did? I took out my violin, and I was right there playing a pity note. You know, telling how, how bad my wife was with me. And like, oh, she, she screams at me all the time. And, uh, she... <laughs> and all the men were like, oh, brother, I feel for you. <laughs> and guess what? There was a man of God by the name of Pastor Sam. And he comes and he says, Armando, come here, man. Come here. He says, do you mind if I speak to you uh, Monday morning at the, at the office? I say, sure, why not? So I'm thinking, wow, this guy, finally I made it to the main office, right? <laughs> but listen, what happens, I get there Monday, and he, um, he says, come here, man, have a seat. He gets up, he stands up, and he goes like this. Who do you think you are to be talking to these men that way about your wife? Don't you understand that these men are going to see your wife the way you were talking about her? And I was like, and at that moment, uh, uh, the little devil came up, and the little, little angel came up, and this guy was telling me, beat him up, how dare him? <laughs> And then the angel said, please have mercy on this man. <laughs> so I decided to have mercy on him. <laughs> but see, this is what I'm telling you. We need to make men accountable once again, but also women. But it all starts with us. Look, look what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 16. It says, three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord your God 
at the place he will choose, at the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of weeks, and the festival of tabernacles. And listen to this. All men, no one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. God was making men responsible for everything that took place in Israel. Everything that happened in Israel. And that goes also for us as a nation and as a church. We have to go back and be responsible for everything that happens in our country and in this church. Don't get me wrong, it's not your fault. But it's our responsibility to fix it. You know, as I was growing up, as I was telling you, you know what? I really wanted to have a father when I was young. I really wanted to have a dad. When I was in Mexico, I have a dad, thank God. But my dad was over here working. He used to go once a year, maybe if dad, and he used to, you know, get my mom pregnant and then she, he will come back over here. And that's the story of our lives. Many men do that. So they leave their families in Mexico. They leave them there. And guess what happens? The same things that happen to children here happen over there. And that's when I experienced being molested, um, violated. Um, and that was the reason I wanted a dad. Because I wanted somebody to protect me. And I never had it. I came here to this country. And guess what? I was so excited because finally I'm going to have a dad. Finally somebody's going to take care of me. And I get here. And that American dream my dad had became a nightmare. Because my dad not took my mom to work. And now I have no dad and I have no mom. And now we're in the streets all the time. And I become a gang member, a drug addict. I end up in prison. Because even though if you had a father, and this is a problem in many, many homes in my community, that we don't know how to spend time with our children. We don't know how to say, I love you. I care for you. What's going on in your life? And that makes us go look for love in all the wrong places. We go look for that. And I, I tell you, I found it. I found love. I found acceptance in the neighborhood, in El Barrio. And I did pretty good. But just, it just took me back. It took me to prison. So listen, more, a lot of people are still like, there's a bunch of experts everywhere. Experts everywhere for everything. And they're still wondering, why is this happening? Why is this decline? Why is, it, uh, why is all this crime happening? Why are all these abortions taking place? Why is all this crime in the rise? Why is all these things happening even inside the church? Why? And they say, probably, can, let's find somebody to blame. It can't, let's blame the Republicans. And then we have half of the church says, no, let's blame the Democrats. <laughs> and it comes a time in our lives where we have to say, no, I have to blame my own self. Because I'm the one that walked away from my home. So you have to start thinking, church, how can we change this? What can we do? I'll tell you one thing. Don't be afraid to speak out. Do not be afraid. We have the greatest book ever written, and it's the, it's the Word of God. Amen. The Word of God is not about race. It's not about money. It's not about division. The Word of God is about unity, love, and respect. Amen. And it starts there. But we are the silence of the land. Look what happens. And again, mom, 
do not worry about these numbers. Can you put them up there? I have a, I don't know if they gave it to you, the numbers on, about poverty and the father absence crisis in America. No? Okay, that's fine. I'll just go over it with you guys. Listen what it says, okay? These children, what they go through in life. Poverty. Four times greater risk of poverty than a child with two parents. Where do you think I grew up, man? I grew up in the ghetto. Violence. Killings. Drugs. Listen to this. Teen pregnancy. Seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teen. We see that everywhere. Church, listen to this. 67, 68%. Of all children born to Hispanic women are born without a father being present. And most likely there's not going to be one for the rest of their lives. Listen to this. My brothers, my sisters, African American. 75%. And it says that in the ghetto, in the barrios, it's probably up to 80% right now. Think about this. Out of a hundred kids that are born, only 20 of them will have a dad and the rest of them won't have one present. Child abuse. What did I just tell you that happened to me? If you are, if you are not calling your son or your daughter at this moment, man, something's happening in that home. Child abuse. Most likely to face abuse and neglect. Most likely to have behavioral problems. More, more, more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. Most likely to go to prison. Most likely to suffer from ob ob obesity and other diseases. Most likely to commit crimes. And two times more likely to drop out of high school. Not finish high school. We, my culture, we have the highest dropout rate in this nation. We don't finish high school. And then it's our brothers, African Americans are the second ones. You know why? Because we don't have a father to motivate us, inspire us, move us, push us, and sometimes even kick us. And you know what? The bell works once in a while as well. How, how you know what? How wonderful it will be that, that we still be able to do that once in a blue moon, right? Because our children are just out of hand. So for you kids that are here, this is a question that I always ask. Because this is a characteristic that Christians should have and express every day of their lives. Gratitude. Children, teenagers, when was the last time you said to your mom or your dad, thank you for knocking out that rant? Thank you for taking me to school, or for providing for me, for the clothes I wear. When was the last time you said something like that? You know that if you were just kids, if you just take the time to appreciate your parents, I'm telling you, you would do so much for them because we do get tired sometimes. And that is so awesome that we're able to have that in our lives. But listen, we need to rediscover knowledge of who God is. We need to do that again. And that's going to help us greatly. I'm telling you, it's going to help us so greatly to be able to stand firm and defeat the enemy and become an overcomer.
We have to do it again. And if you're one of those persons or people that have a struggle with that, with race, I ask you to take the time today here in this church and tell the Lord to forgive you. Forgive you for your ignorance because that's exactly what it is. It's ignorance because you're missing on so much. You know, the first time that I hugged a black man, it wasn't in Esperanza. <laughs> it was in a church like this. I remember uh, when I started going to church, I had Kiara in my, in my arms, my, da- my older daughter. And we used to sit way in the back where all the other couples had kids. It's Stacy the Berry. Um, they were wonderful people. And he was an African guy who was taller than me. He was big, wide. And you know what? The, in, um, and the pastor said, good morning, everyone. Uh, go, go say hello to somebody. If you, if you want, go ahead and give, you, give a godly hug or something like that. And, um, and so uh, I, I'm, I'm like, I hope nobody comes to me and I have my baby lady. <laughs> okay, so far so good. But then I looked like this and I saw that guy and he was... <laughs> The guy was looking for somebody to hug, man. <laughs> he was looking and looking. And you know what? He was going to other people on the other aisles. And he was hugging them. And he had a beautiful smile on his face. <laughs> I wanted to run away. Because I knew he was going to come to me. He came and I didn't know how to, like, I knew I was going to have to give him a hug, man, but I didn't know how. Because the only time I ever hugged a man was when I was in prison, but when we were stabbing each other. And he comes, he says, come here, come here. He hugs me. With so much love. He broke me that day. And for the first time in my life, I understood what was godly love. (laughs) And ever since, that's been my, that's been my call in life. that we come together as a church and be an example, a role model to this fallen world out there. And I, and this is, this is a, this is something that the Lord put in my heart for you today. Romans chapter 12. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. Sorry. But keep your, your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord, with the Lord's people. Share with them who are in need. That means that we go out of our way to serve our community. It says, practice hospitality. When was the last time that you had somebody different from you, your skin, color, and your home? Because you invited that person. 
because you just wanted to love on them. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Be willing. And I tell you, you don't have to go that far. If you go home, open your door. There's a whole world out there that you can start hugging people left and right. Look what it says, verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. And do not be proud. I love that. Don't be conceited. There's nothing wrong if you love yourself. Good. But don't do it too much. Start loving other people. It works. Do not be proud. Don't be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And listen to this. If it's possible, as far as depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And that is the calling for the church today. I don't know about you, church. But I get tired of listening to so much evil in our news. And everywhere we go. So I want you to, before you leave this place, to think about what I just said. And learn how to love and respect each other from today on. I'll be back. I know I am. It might take more years, but I'll be back. <laughs> I hope that by that time, we are doing much better. And Horizon will be our church where a great movement is going to start. And this is not going to be the first nor the last time. So I invite you, come back later on. Get to know us. We are just like you. A great man once said this to me. A very wise man said, brother, you are just like me. The only difference is that you got caught and I didn't. <laughs> Amen, Pastor Brad. <laughs> God bless you all. Let's stand to our feet if you would. The world is saying hate, but God is saying love. God is saying be a peacemaker. The world says cancel, but God says don't cancel back. Love. The world says if they hit you, counterpunch. But God says if they hit you, turn the other cheek. Can I just tell you something, church? <clears throat> We watch CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News too much, and they all make us mad. And if there's anger that's coming up in you when you watch it, I just want you to know that anger is not a fruit of the Spirit. I, I, I tend to agree with you, Armando. Just turn the stuff off. Get, get some good news that's balanced somewhere that you can bring on to your computer and take a look. We want to know what's going on, but we don't want all this bias coming through on both sides. We love each other. That's what we're about. Now, I think it would be impossible to live in this world as a Caucasian and not realize that there are some things that we're not aware of when it comes to other cultures. And it might even be a bit prejudiced, but we don't mean for it to be because we have good hearts. We want to do the right thing. But I want us to examine our hearts and see if there's anything in there that's racist, anything in there that makes someone else more uncomfortable anything in there that isn't about making peace, being a peacemaker. Would you just examine your heart for a second? Lord, here we are. 
We've heard our brother today, Lord, and he said that love broke him down. And your word says that you are love and that love never fails. So, Lord, we pray that you'd fill our hearts with love. If there's any place where we've had thoughts that were put in our head by the news and not from your word, your truth, or your spirit, then I just pray that you'd help us. Help us to respect and to love in Jesus' name.